Well, thank you all very much for joining us for this podcast on familial chylomicronemia syndrome. And uh, I'm going to start with some background on familial chylomicronemia. And then uh, we'll have Dr. Daniel Gaudet, who is a, a leader in the field of FCS and also uh, has mentored me along the way with some great advice on patients that I have with this disorder. And he's going to discuss uh, some of the clinical diagnostic uh, protocols or uh, scoring systems to help you make decisions about which patients likely have FCS. These are my disclosures. So as I'm sure most of you know, uh, familial chylomicronemia syndrome presents with severe hypertriglyceridemia. One of the hallmarks is a very poor response to medications. Uh, patients have usually a personal history of recurrent pancreatitis. They can have sporadic family members that also have recurrent pancreatitis, keeping in mind that this is an autosomal recessive disorder. So carriers in the family might just have some mild hypertriglyceridemia, but the index patient who's received two uh, abnormal alleles for one of the genes associated with uh, chylomicronemia syndrome will present with the worst phenotype, usually multiple episodes of recurrent uh, pancreatitis. So as I mentioned, it's an autosomal recessive inheritance, and uh, it can have variable penetrance. I have a patient who's had 30 episodes of pancreatitis since she was three years old. Her sister has exactly the same genotype, and it only had one episode of pancreatitis when she was pregnant. Uh, and her parents just have mild hypertriglyceridemia because they are heterozygous for the mutation in uh, the lipoprotein lipase gene. Uh, traditionally, chylomicronemia syndrome has been thought to be uh, unlikely to increase risk for coronary disease or for atherosclerosis because chylomicrons are so large and not thought to participate in atherosclerosis. But as many as 10 to 15% of patients with a clinical diagnosis of chylomicronemia syndrome can have coronary artery disease. So just to remind you of the lipid metabolism, which uh, I think you're all familiar with, uh, we have two ways we get lipids into the bloodstream. One is the exogenous pathway, in other words, from dietary fat, and the other is endogenous, which is based on what is produced by the liver. And as you all know, when we eat, uh, dietary fats, it gets packaged in the intestine into a chylomicron. You can see here the chylomicron has APOC2, which is a apoprotein that activates lipoprotein lipase. Uh, chylomicrons have about 10 triglycerides to every cholesterol, and they're called chylomicrons because they're actually picked up from the intestine by the lymphatics and then dumped into the bloodstream through the thoracic duct. Uh, as you all know, uh, the, when this particle goes through the capillaries and the muscles, the capillaries have lipoprotein lipase on the endothelial surface, which can then be activated by the APOC2 on triglyceride-rich particles like chylomicrons. And the lipoprotein lipase removes triglycerides from the particles, and they're broken down into free fatty acids for use as energy. So some things about lipoprotein lipase that are very important. Uh, number one, as I mentioned, it breaks down triglycerides from triglyceride-rich lipoproteins like chylomicrons and VLDL and delivers free fatty acids uh, into the muscles. Uh, secondly, it's activated by APOC2, which we talked about. It can be inhibited by APOC3. So in those patients that have C3 on their triglyceride-rich particles, there's an inhibition of lipoprotein lipase. And then how is lipoprotein lipase made? Well, it is made in adipocytes and myocytes. So in muscle and fat cells, it has to be produced as lipoprotein lipase. Then it has to be matured so it can leave those cells and get out into the interstitium. And that requires a factor called LMF1 or lipoprotein lipoprotein uh, maturation factor one. And then once it's in the interstitium, it has to be 
brought from the interstitium into the capillary lumen. And that requires what I tend to call the long arm of the space shuttle. It's like a robotic arm. It's a protein that uh, swings out of the capillary into the interstitial space, picks up the lipoprotein lipase, and then brings the lipoprotein lipase back into the capillary lumen. That protein is called GPI-HBP1. So you can start to think about all the things that can go wrong genetically that can make the system not work, right? You could have an abnormal gene for lipoprotein lipase. You could have an abnormal gene for the lipase maturation factor, LMF1. You could have an abnormal gene for the protein that picks up that lipase and brings it into the capillary lumen, the GPI-HBP1. And so there's a couple more things that can uh, get screwed up to cause chylomicronemia. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. This is just sort of a schematic of the GPI HP1, HBP1 protein. And you can see that the myocytes and adipocytes make the lipoprotein lipase on the bottom of the slide. That's in the, gets secreted into the interstitium. And then the uh, protein GPI HBP1 swings down into the interstitium, picks up the lipoprotein lipase, and in this picture has brought it back. It's shown in red here, a red dot brought it back into the capillary lumen where it can interact with the chylomicron. And remembering that it's the APOC2 on the chylomicron that turns on that lipoprotein lipase. This is just a more stylized picture of the protein swinging outside of the capillary lumen, which is shown in pink on the top, picking up the lipoprotein lipase in the subendothelial space and then swinging it back into the capillary lumen where it's available to triglyceride-rich particles. Now, one other thing we didn't talk about. So we talked about LMF1. We talked about the gene for lipoprotein lipase itself. We talked about the protein, GPI-HBP1. And we talked about APOC2 being necessary to activate lipoprotein lipase. But it turns out that apoprotein A5, apolipoprotein A5, which is delivered by HDL uh, to the area where lipoprotein lipase is working on a triglyceride-rich particle. And in this diagram, it's VLDL. ApoA5 holds the lipoprotein lipase, the ApoC2, and the lipid particle in the right configuration. It's almost like a fork that grabs all of the pieces and holds them together in the right configuration to facilitate removal of triglycerides. So that's the final gene that can cause uh, familial chylomicronemia syndrome uh, would be a, a mutation in ApoA5. So there are those five genes that can lead to uh, the monogenic disorder. Now, just to give you an idea of what the relative frequency of these different mutations are, you can see that 95% of patients who present with uh, FCS have a uh, lipoprotein lipase mutation. So that is sort of the classic discussion that FCS is due to a uh, lipoprotein lipase mutation. About 2% have an APOC2 mutation, so their C2 doesn't activate lipoprotein lipase. 2% have that long arm of the space shuttle the protein, the GPI HBP1 mutation. And very rare would be an APOA5 mutation, which is about 0.6% of patients. And LMF1, uh, the lipase maturation factor, would be 0.4%. So the majority of patients you're going to see, which are still relatively rare patients, are going to have a lipoprotein lipase mutation on both alleles uh, because, as I mentioned, it's an autosomal recessive disorder. So... It, you should know that um, patients can be carriers. The carriers are going to be heterozygotes. Uh, obviously, the parents will have one mutation, maybe one uh, LPL mutation on one allele and a normal allele uh, on the other allele. And it's the child who gets uh, both bad genes from uh, each parent because it is a recessive trait. Um, and that, so the parents or the carriers can have mild to moderately reduced uh, lipoprotein lipase activity. They have mild triglyceride elevation, usually in the 200 to 750 range, and frequently have not had a history of pancreatitis. Um, I just wanted to put this slide in here, not to drive you crazy, but to remind me to talk about 
one thing with APOC3. I mean, some of you know that there's an anti-sense medication against APOC3, which hopefully will be reviewed by the FDA in the next few months, which seems to be quite effective in patients with familial chylomicronemia syndrome. And you might ask yourself, why do patients get benefit when uh, you are inhibiting APOC3, which would, if you think about it, C3 is an inhibitor of lipoprotein lipase. So if you remove C3, you should have enhanced activity of lipoprotein lipase. On the other hand, these patients often have no activity of their lipoprotein lipase because of uh, mutations in their alleles for the gene for LPL. So why would removing inhibition on a enzyme that doesn't work uh, cause benefit in these patients? And it turns out that APOC3 doesn't just inhibit lipoprotein lipase. It inhibits other lipases like hepatic lipase, and it may even have some effect on other receptors on the liver that could pick up chylomicrons. So we don't know exactly how this drug works uh, for patients with chylomicronemia syndrome, but even with zero activity of their lipoprotein lipase, they get a, a drop in their triglycerides when given an antisense against APOC3. And there are a couple theories. One is that uh, the hepatic lipase has inhibition removed and it can, it can uh, increase its affinity for chylomicrons when uninhibited and others that there may be other receptors on the liver that are picking up some of the chylomicrons. The other question that I think if you're interested in lipid metabolism, you might ask yourself is, why does this disorder just cause hypertriglyceridemia due to chylomicrons in the blood? Wouldn't you expect to have VLDL go up also if your lipoprotein lipase doesn't work? And that's a very interesting thing because these patients generally just have chylomicrons in their blood. And, and the reason is that hepatic lipase, the lipase on the liver, actually has a much stronger affinity for VLDL than it does for chylomicrons. So it seems like the liver's hepatic lipase can handle uh, the VLDL even in the absence of lipoprotein lipase, whereas uh, it has a hard time clearing chylomicrons. So that's why you see chylomicronemia without VLDL being elevated in the absence of lipoprotein lipase. So the physical findings are uh, common with any cause of hypertriglyceridemia. This isn't specific to chylomicronemia syndrome, but uh, you get these tuberal eruptive xanthomas, and if you biopsy them, they have uh, triglycerides in them. And this is just another example on the trunk. They usually occur on the trunk, the elbows, and the buttocks. You can also get fat deposits in the retina, giving you lipemia retinalis. Um, and those physical findings aren't always there, but they, again, are not pathognomonic for chylomicronemia, but any severe hypertriglyceridemic syndrome. So let's get terminology down uh, for a second. So these genetic mutations that we talked about, autosomal recessive uh, presentations of a genotype that causes the disease, are called monogenic familial chylomicronemia. This is rare. We're talking somewhere around one in a million patients that present with this recessive disorder. And again, they have a very poor response to medication. And currently, the only treatment is to put the patients on an extremely low-fat diet, less than 20 grams fat a day. And then they get whatever fat supplementation they get is in uh, the form of medium-chain triglycerides, which are absorbed without making chylomicrons. So you just have to reduce chylomicron formation by giving a very low-fat diet. Um, on the other hand, there is a syndrome called multifactorial chylomicronemia. We used to call it polygenic, but the better, the better descriptive term is multifactorial chylomicronemia syndrome. Those patients tend to have more subtle metabolic disorders, maybe some SNPs that lead to high triglycerides, but they're okay until you add some other triglyceride raising comorbidity on top of it, such as diabetes or uh, insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome or alcohol. And one of the differentiators is those patients are much more responsive to medication. So if you treat their diabetes, get their blood sugar in order, or you add omega-3s or phenofibrate, you see a much greater response to the therapy uh, with those treatments than you would with monogenic familial chylomicronemia. 
And I'm going to finish my portion with a little bit about the clinical and psychosocial burden. Uh, I've published an article on this. Mike Davidson published a terrific article on this. But looking at a group of patients who have FCS, there are some very common uh, things. Number one, you can see that uh, the patients that we interviewed, their average age was 48. But most of the patients developed their symptoms quite early. That's common with uh, monogenic pilomicronemia, less so with the multifactorial. So 15 years old was the average age of onset. Plasma values of triglycerides on average were in the 10,500 level at, at their max. And even when they were doing well on their diet, their triglycerides were averaging around 1,300. Each patient averaged 34 episodes of pancreatitis and 17 hospitalizations. So these are really sick patients. And uh, you can imagine that that makes it difficult for them. Uh, frequently, they have chronic GI discomfort, abdominal pain, nausea, diarrhea, back pain, headache. Uh, those are very common things. You can imagine that uh, they've been accused of being alcoholics frequently. Uh, several of them have had their gallbladders taken out uh, because of a misdiagnosis. So seven out of 10 patients with FCS have a cholecystectomy, probably due to some concern that they may have... Uh, cholelithiasis as their reason for their abdominal pain. And obviously the most common and serious complication is acute pancreatitis. And with recurrent pancreatitis, a lot of these patients go on to develop type two diabetes and our type one diabetes, a, a true insulin deficiency. So I'm just gonna tweak you a little bit to think about something. What happens if a patient has chylomicronemia syndrome where they need to be on a very low fat diet so they don't make chylomicrons. And they present now with diabetes after multiple episodes of pancreatitis. And someone who doesn't know the disorder sends them to a dietitian who puts them on a diabetic diet. So you're all familiar with the fact that a diabetic diet is gonna be low in carbohydrates and higher in fat, and that will make them worse. So it's very important to have a dietitian who understands the disorder it's very important to take a history of someone with diabetes has had recurrent pancreatitis and find out which came first. And if the pancreatitis antedated the diabetes and they have very high triglycerides, you should think about FCS. And obviously the uh, diet that you put them on is gonna be completely different than the traditional diabetic diet. The other thing that these patients complain of is sort of a memory fog, difficulty with memory, foggy head. You can imagine that they have trouble going out to family outings because there's nothing to eat. They have trouble going out with friends. They have to bring their own food. Uh, they're often uh, thought to be pain medication seeking because they have this chronic pain syndrome and uh, often thought to be hypochondriacs. And unfortunately, uh, accused of being alcoholics frequently also. So obviously the diet is very difficult to maintain. Everybody else in the household has to make sure that these patients have appropriate diet. Often their spouses are focused on helping them with uh, cooking and, and uh, making sure that they're on the right diet. Patients' satisfaction with their life is generally difficult. They miss lots of days of work, so they have trouble keeping a job. So it, it really has a tremendous impact on their life as a whole. Um, so I'm going to uh, stop here. I think I've covered all the issues that I want to cover about the clinical presentation and the genetics and turn it over to uh, one of my heroes, Dr. Daniel Gaudet, who is uh, with the Clinical Lipidology and Rare Lipid Disorders Unit at the Department of Medicine the University of Montreal, uh, and also the Lipid Clinic in Chicoutimi, Quebec. He's going to talk about the clinical diagnostic score in Europe. And, you know, I know Dr. Gaudet has some ideas on how we could make that score better with just a few tweaks, and he's going to explain, you know, his thoughts on that, as well as the future impact for these patients with FCS in North America. So thank you very much, Daniel, for joining us. And I look forward to hearing your portion of the presentation. So thank you, Alan, for this uh, very complete and ex extensive presentation. And uh, I would like to, uh, to say hello to everybody, uh, hoping that in the near future, we'll be able to meet face to face and without a mask at the NLA meeting. So uh, what I will in a few minutes today, 
discuss is uh, the uh, interest of accurately diagnose FCS and discriminate uh, the m more frequent multifactorial forms uh, and the familial columnar syndrome forms, which is uh, rare, but uh, the, it involves different risks. But for the patient's perspective, it also involves access to different treatments. So it's important that we accurately uh, diagnose the patients and uh, making sure that everybody has the right uh, access to the right uh, treatment, the, the right diagnosis to start with and the right treatment afterwards. So here are my disclosures. <clears throat> Uh, well, what I will I, I will just summarize what we will do today. So, re reviewing the new clinical relevant data on columnar diagnosis, discriminating multifactorial and monogenic forms, uh, present clinical diagnosis scoring systems, starting with the European one, which has been published two years ago, discuss genetic diagnosis, exactly what Adam has just said. Uh, it's important to uh, establish a con consensual way to correctly diagnose so that the payers, the health decision makers, the health care providers and patients themselves uh, are aware of what they are, what, what is the real uh, form of the disease they are, they are affected by, what is the, the drug which, which can be prescribed or the treatment which can be prescribed starting with the diet as Alan explained and then what who could have access to what and will be reimbursed. So it's, it's fundamental. I will present the European Atherosclerosis Society Task Force position on the diagnosis of cardiomyocranemia and then discuss uh, the diagnosis challenge from the perspectives of, of the, 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 the uh, stakeholders, including on the perspective of uh, the patients from patients' shoes. So uh, all lipidologists, almost all lipidologists are very familiar, familiar, familiar with uh, clinical diagnosis scoring systems uh, in FH. We use regularly several of them and it works. However, um, compared to cholesterol, triglycerides is more complex physiologically, metabolically, genetically. So uh, it raises a huge translational challenge uh, to be sure that we uh, correctly assess cardiomyocranemia diagnosis. So it's a complicated disorder and our uh, objective is to achieve a simple way to diagnose cardiomyocranemia. Uh, and the domain of best practice uh, in lipidology uh, when we're, we're dealing with rare diseases, it's almost impossible to uh, achieve the level of evidence that, that we can reach with more common disorders. So it's, it will be based on clinical experience on expert opinions and also on patients' experience. What we should avoid, however, and it's imperative that we avoid that, is uh, having kind of a in-between situation, not necessarily chaotic, but I would say unclear, uh, unclear in a situation where payers don't know if they have to remember this, if the, the health decision makers or the uh, regulatory agencies uh, disagree on the, uh, the, the, the elements that we bring to them and that the patients themselves don't know exactly what they are suffering of. Uh, due to what I, and I also highlighted uh, in the recent years, let's say it started approximately 10 years ago, uh, when with LPL gene replacement therapy and then the OC3 inhibitors uh, and GPTL3 inhibitors, next generation omega-3, there are several new pharmacologic approaches for cardiomyocranemia, which have been developed or are still under development. And it raised interest in, in cardiomyocranemia for diff these reasons and other reasons. And the accuracy of, uh, uh, of the diagnosis becomes critical, pivotal. So in the last two years, there have been more publications on cardiomyocranemia than in the last 30 years. And among these publications, what, what can we uh, just uh, extract from, from uh, what has been published in the last two years? Well, there, there were more than 40 publications describing or comparing columnar phenotypes, genotypes, prevalence, physiology, or burden. Uh, FCS diagnosis scoring systems have been proposed and published. Papers on the genetic basis of severe hypertriglyceridemia and polygenic risk scores have been published as well. 
And as I said, the EAS Task Force on Rare Dyslipidemias has met twice and has finally published uh, in January this year an algorithm to diagnose calomacronemia. There are more papers than the one on this slide that have been interested in the differential diagnosis of uh, calomacronemia. But among these papers, uh, what we, we know is that FCS is rare by nature, rare by essence. So it's pivotal again, extremely important that we can discriminate these patients affected by the rare form because the risk is different, because the treatment and access to treatment uh, will be determined, determined by the, uh, the, the accurate diagnosis. So among the publications, some were uh, specifically dedicated to developing a diagnosis score system. Th th this was the uh, paper published by Moulin and, and, and others in Natural Sclerosis in 2018. Whereas, as I said, uh, the, uh, uh, the EAS uh, task force position paper in, published in January was very different by nature. And all the others are based on either clinical biochemical markers, uh, medical history, or uh, genetic uh, basis of the disease. Let's start from the beginning. Uh, I didn't explain what colomicronemia is, but let, let's let, let's uh, uh, summarize the burden of the disease. So, uh, colomicronemia per se is not fair, not fair at all. Uh, approximately per, per, one, per, one, uh, one over one over six hundred individuals might be affected by colomicronemia, which could be sustained or or not. Uh, the majority of uh, these colomicronemic patients have a multifactorial or, or polygenic form. The uh, monogenic form, the familial colomicronemia syndrome, affects one or two per million individuals. And usually it affects us, again, Alan has already covered that. Uh, it's caused by B allelic homozygosity or compounded heterozygosity for rare uh, variants having a la large size effect, loss of function variants, obviously, affecting LPL activity directly or indirectly. Approximately one third, however, of patients with cardiomyocronemia have a high polygenic risk score when this has been tested. The challenge is, do we need to, uh, to establish the, 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 genetic, the polygenic risk score to, to achieve or to establish a genetic diagnosis to accurately diagnose FCS? Approximately a little less than 20% uh, of patients have uh, colomacronemia due to heterozygosity for rare loss of function variants, having large size effect plus other parameters, uh, metabolic syndrome, drugs, alcohol, etc. But, and importantly, uh, more than half of patients presenting with colomacronemia, meaning having triglyceride levels above 10 millimolar or a little less than 900 milligram per deciliter, remain genetically undefined. So let's start from the, uh, the beginning. Colomicronemia can be sustained or recurrent. If it's just all those affected by the monogenic form, the familial colomicronemia syndrome, present sustained colomicronemia. Their TG levels are almost always above 900. However, there are other patients who also present sustained colomicronemia and we and it highlighted that at the end of this presentation, we don't uh, have identified a genetic basis for this. However, for those affected by multifactorial colomacronemia, thus can present sustained colomacronemia, but all, most, most often present episodic or recurrent colomacronemia that can be treated because these individuals have a LP biologically, they are, they are able to produce uh, LPL, which is competent and active. Uh, if we treat the underlying causes affecting phys the physio physiological uh, deficiency of LPL, we can bring to the body some LPL capacity so that we can um, be able to decrease TG levels, which is not the case in patients with a monogenic form where they, are in, they have no capacity biologically to produce LPL. This has been covered already by Alan. I won't. I won't say a word about that. 
Sustained color macronymia, clinical signs, again, Ananas presented that. So uh, the, the specificity and sensitivity of this is, uh, is, is not sufficient to establish accurate diagnosis because a lot of multifactorial color macronymic patients can uh, presenting all of these clinical signs here, one day or another. However, and this has been highlighted already, uh, the FCS consequences are huge um, because it's sustained and because it, it contributes a very important risk of disease. Acute pancreatitis being one of them, but it's not the only one. Uh, the uh, emotional impact on the patient and anxiety is extremely important, but there are a lot of uh, elements that, uh, uh, you know, color macronymia per se, it's a lipidology textbook. Uh, it's by essence and nature associated with HDL uh, deficiency of, by, of due to different reasons, less HDL particles and lower APOA1 concentration, uh, problem of HDL maturation, and also we have established that the, 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 these patients have also cholesterol esterification problem with LCAT deficiency. So it's a kind of hypobeta lipoproteinemia. Uh, or abetal lipoproteinemia phenotype as well, plus uh, HDL deficiency with huge color micron population. non alcoholic fatty liver disease is part of the disease. I'm saying that because there are several agents in development for, for an NFLD or NASH, and some of these agents might be uh, helpful for patients affected by color micronemia, particularly FCS. So from patient's shoes, again, uh, and as I highlighted uh, this before, so I will not insist, but just try to put yourself for 24 hours in the shoes of a patient affected by the FCS, just in, by eating what they have to eat. Uh, it's, it's, it's not, honestly, uh, it's not an easy, it's not an easy way of life. It's uh, from the patient's perspective, it's not an easy disease. It's perceived as being some, something that is not little or rarely little, so um, the risk is underestimated for those having not presented uh, 10 or 100 uh, episodes of acute pancreatitis already. But the the, uh, the, most, uh, the, 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 the fear of pancreatitis in the, among patients of FCS is, is, is an important uh, uh, co contributor to uh, the interference with the quality of life. So, all this highlight the importance of accurately distinguish between FCS and MCS. So we can, how can we distinguish between both forms? We can obviously measure plasma post pill activity, which is unfeasible at the large scale, it's expensive, it's time consuming, it's not validated, and it's risky. Uh, and again, it's not very, for the patients, it's not something which is fun. We can use next generation sequencing technologies and genetic diagnosis. But again, it's not available everywhere. Uh, it's not always feasible. But we can develop simple clinical diagnosis scoring systems correlating with one and two with the, uh, the genotype and with the LPL activity. And this is feasible. However, the EAS Society, the EAS Task Force uh, for the Diagnosis of Color Macronemia is based on next generation sequencing once uh, sustained color macronemia has been demonstrated. So again, it's the, in the ideal world, that would be the way to do this. Uh, if we accept, and Alan raised that, and it's true, that not all FCS phenotypes uh, will present uh, or, or, or a, a clear-cut genotype associated with the phenotype. Uh, you are all are aware of the existence of circulating antibodies, LPL, circulating antibodies, uh, um, LMF1, GPI-HPB1, circulating antibodies, and these are not genetic, uh, genetic, genetic cause of FCS, but it can cause FCS. And there are other forms of polygenic, again, very, uh, the, the accumulation of variants having a small size effect, if you have many of them, you can eventually present FCS without uh, having a clear cut monogenic di diagnosis. Uh, and a um, paper from Dron and Robbie Gilly uh, last year in Journal of Clinical Lipidology highlighted that. So in purple, you have the, uh, 
the, the uh, prevalence of uh, the large size loss of function variance, which per se, if you are a mosaic or compounded mosaic, cause FCS. But you, we still, as I lighted before, more than 50% of individuals for whom we cannot establish the genetic uh, background. So uh, a couple of years ago, um, a couple of clinicians in Europe, in France and in the Netherlands, thought about it. And well, they, they decided to try to diagnose cardiomyocardia to distinguish fungal forms versus multifactorial through um, a sc diagnosis scoring system. In parallel and at the same time, and we, we, we didn't contact each other. We were working on, a, on, a, on the same uh, kind of, of, of tool. The European uh, diagnosis scoring system is based on uh, a score, is a, a, a weight given to different clinical metabol or metabolic variables. TG levels, obviously. Uh, and TG levels, well, it, it's, it's, uh, if it's sustained, that means that if you have low TG levels, you might not be uh, from an FCS. Um, controlling for secondary causes is essential. Uh, history of pancreatitis, we should understand that not all FCS patients have had the pancreatitis episode. It's exactly the same paradigm that we see in FH. Not all of them um, without treatment will develop uh, a cardiac event uh, at the same age. But there are patients who have had so many episodes that they present pancreatic insufficiency. Um, there, there are a couple of elements that the European scoring system doesn't take into account, and we'll cover that rapidly. And there is something that they have considered, which might not be uh, the best way to do it at this time. So, but the exercise was important, but it was not consensual. It has to be op optimized. So they they are considered the is family f family history, uh, and the uh, if they consider that if you are FCS, which is a in recessive disorder that your family history will be and be, will be normal so that you you won't have an history of fungal combined hyperlipidemia which is not the case by the way because being a carrier of lp of lpl null variant is not neutral um so but the scores the score works quite well we, we assess that and just to highlight the fact that it's it's important to consider the family history in FCS patients, it is in multifactorial forms as well. The family history cannot distinguish between the FCS and MCM because in both situations you'll have a family combined hyperlipidemia-like uh, history. The majority of if the results will be either not present a normal lipid profile, they could present moderate hypertriglyceridemia, severe hypertriglyceridemia if they are are the factors involved. Low HDL is only the low HDL, high APOB without not anything else. So it's variable, but there, there is a, a, com, a multiple possible phenotypes in the affected relatives. So uh, in a set of 145 heterozygotes uh, of, uh, in, in, a fam uh, in 17 families, FCS families, uh, we have observed that the majority of LPL variants could could present almost all uh, Fredrickson class class of lipid disorder, and in, 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 in we add to that is isolated IPO alpha. However, something which is interesting is that the European scores, as presented, correlates quite well with post apparent LPL activity. We have assessed that in a set of FCS patients, which were homozygous homozygous for uh, null LPL variants and heterozygotes for the same mutation. So uh, the uh, coefficient of deter determination is uh, 0.63. So 62% of the score can be 62% of the LPL activity correlates with the score. This is excellent, but it means that it's we're not there. In, in, in a, it's it's not enough, but it's very very good. So there are strengths and limitations of the European Clinical Diagnosis Scoring System and of uh, limitation and strengths for the EAS um, algorithm, which is more d d based on genes. Uh, the, the European Clinical Diagnosis Scoring System fairly correlates with, with the genetic diagnosis and PHLA. It's based on simple and widely available variables. 
It does not consider key samples of variable characterizing FCS physiology, such as LDL cholesterol, it could be or the, uh, the anthropometrics. Uh, it's not necessarily adequately weighed the family history in several, several cases. So there is a risk of misclassification of some cases in this can be easily improved. And that's something that we, I will present in a few minutes. The uh, genetic diagnosis scoring system, well, it's very good to identify almost all monogenic forms except those with, uh, as, as explained before, with, with other parameters. It facilitates family screening of heterozygote carrier, carriers in uh, affected pedigrees. It provides a clear diagnosis to the patient, uh, an accurate risk assessment, and importantly, uh, guarantee access to therapies. However, NGS technologies are not available or affordable everywhere. And uh, again, it may not identify some phenotypic FCS or cases of sustained colomicronemia of other causes, as explained. Uh, this comes from the approach and compass clinical trials of uh, pa patients coming from, uh, which was evaluating volanisorcin, which is an EPO C3 PSO. So these, there were 57 FCS patients and hundreds of multifactorial, in, in, if we combine both studies. Uh, and the exercise was to uh, to look at simple variables to discriminate between FCS and MCM. Uh, and in, interestingly, if you look at uh, the, uh, the the rock uh, the uh, um, curves and sensitivity and specificity param parameters, LDL cholesterol, APOA1, APOB, BMI, HDL cholesterol, pancreatitis history, uh, TG levels are very good correlates. This, uh, and we, there were cutoffs established for each of these variables in the, in these studies, which are a little bit different than the, the one, the ones have been used in Europe or the one that we have used. But there is more and more data being providing evidence that we can establish a very good, uh, diagnosis through, um, diagnosis scoring systems. What we have done and published this year uh, is approximately the same, but what I'm highlighting here is uh, the importance of the BMI to, uh, well, you, you will, there are some FCS who are obese, but it's rarer, but there are some FCS who are uh, lean, I mean, unhealthy uh, weight uh, with BMI below 20 or 18 in some cases. Overweight and, or obesity is rarer in FCS, and it's very, very frequent in multifactorial, which is very often associated with the metabolic syndrome. It will be LDL cholesterol, the history of pancreatitis. All these uh, variables are, are um, important. So when we have used the European clinical scoring system that I've presented, and we have repl replaced the familial uh, history with BMI, LDL cholesterol, or B APOB, then we improved uh, the, the uh, accuracy of the diagnosis significantly. And if we add as an option, the genetic diagnosis to that, we, we can correctly uh, discriminate almost all cases. So in conclusion, translating the severe hypertriglyceridemia complexity into a valid, simple, affordable, global diagnosis algorithm requires uh, an international effort. That's what has been done the, la the last two years. And it's very interesting. NGS technologies are rapidly evolving and their use become more affordable and widely available, but we're not still there. Actually, it's not feasible everywhere and it's not necessarily uh, feasible for, for different reasons, te technologically or because of the cost. Clinically useful diagnosis scoring systems for columnar have been developed and can be improved based on the results of recent studies characterizing FCS and MCM. So uh, moving to, uh, towards a global diagnosis approach of chronic microanemia, uh, we have learned a lot of things in the recent years. First of all, uh, there are key characteristics we can distinguish accurately FCS from MCM, uh, and they are easily easy to measure or to document. Anthropometrics, LDL cholesterol, um, the uh, prior history of uh, medical history of pancreatitis age diagnosis, secondary causes, response to fibroid, because the majority of FCS patients will not respond or very poorly respond to agents uh, having a mechanism, mechanism of action driven by LPL activity. Um, and the use of 
next generation sequencing technology of to, of or of genetic diagnosis, uh, it, it it has to be used if it's available, if a, a board of affordable, and for all ambiguous phenotypes um, based on clinical scores or limit clinical scores. And if we combine both, then it will we will solve the problem of accurate diagnosis. So I would like to thank all of you for having listened to this presentation and I dedicated it to uh, all affected patients and all healthcare providers treating these patients. Thank you very much. I had a call in by phone because I think somebody's got me muted on the computer. I'm unable to turn on my microphone. <laughs> I apologize for the technical difficulties. I don't quite understand why the phone uh, was getting louder and softer. Uh, Daniel, that was fantastic presentation. I, I'm not seeing any Q and A's, but uh, I am very curious as to what percentage of your clinical chylomicronemia syndrome patients are you seeing that have no gene abnormalities? And how many of those are you able to use a, a, a like a polygenic score to make the diagnosis? I saw that it was 50% or greater that didn't have monogenic uh, abnormalities. But I, I'm curious how you're dealing with those patients and uh, whether, I, I think you told me once about 15% of them were type three. Okay, uh, for the multifactorial forms, we can split the, this uh, this Christmas tree into uh, more specific diagnosis. So type three patients, some of them can present recurrently colomicronemia. The, 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 the first challenge is to distinguish between FCS and multifactorial colomicronemia. I mean, monogenic form or all phenotypes being similar to the monogenic forms. And as you highlighted, and it's true, there are patients who phenotypically uh, are clear FCS patients, but for whom we are, we are unable to establish uh, the monogenic demonstration of, of, of causality. And having a high polygenic score uh, can be interesting, I mean, philosophically, but uh, the, the challenge here is to uh, providing an accurate diagnosis to the patient and making sure that this patient has access to therapies being developed specifically for rare disorders and the FCS disease. Uh, and I, I'm aware of, I, I know that uh, several of my colleagues across Canada, at least, have patients who have to come to, to, for, for aphoresis, colomicron aphoresis, regularly having recurrent pancreatitis but no uh, genetic causes having been um, identified as causing this phenotype. The uh, multifactorial form, it, one size doesn't fit all. If, uh, if it's, like, it's important to, uh, to, 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 to more accurately diagnose the, the, uh, the, the multifactorial forms, and yes, several of them, uh, present type 3 dyslipidemia if uh, even in heterozygotes for EPOE2 if they are uh, they have a high polygenic score or if they are heterozygotes for uh, loss of function mutations. 
Yes, I have a APO E2 E2 patient who has uh, an APO A5 hydrozygous mutation, and he behaves exactly like a monogenic myelomicronemia. I'm not quite sure why he doesn't respond to any therapy, but he's had uh, multiple episodes of pancreatitis. And I have a 14-year-old South Asian girl who's had about 10 episodes of pancreatitis, uh, non-responsive to any triglyceride-lowering therapy, and she has a negative genotype. All her five genes were normal, and I believe her APOE mutations or, or uh, genotype was also normal. So I struggle with those people, and I, I'm hoping that your scoring system will somehow help us get access to the medications for these patients. Convinced the regulators that uh, it's important that uh, the con the, the uh, consider either a, the uh, a high uh, di di clinical diagnosis score or uh, the genetic diagnosis, something that uh, has been applied to FH. So, uh, and it's feasible. I'm looking at some questions here. Um, one, one was asking a question about type 3, 3C diabetes in patients with FCS. Well, that's an interesting question because patients with FCS uh, frequently develop diabetes and it's a combination of type 2 diabetes and the, the uh, for those having had several episodes of acute pancreatitis, a question of, the, of a pancreatic insufficiency. So it's often uh, both are contributory, but even in the absence of acute pancreatitis, patients with FCS can develop the classical uh, type 2 diabetes. But again, there is something else to consider is the pancre pancreas com competency. Uh, regarding agents, fibrates, omega-3s, or oral that these agents will work in, uh, pa in patients with multifactorial chronomicronemia uh, uh, to, to, if they, they have residual LP activity or if they are for at least that um, elements linked to the metabolic syndrome. For FCS patients, um, well, fibrates is interesting, and fibrates it's, it's, are omega 3. It's probably one of the, the simple tools that we can use to accurately diagnose uh, FCS or dis distinguish between FCS and multifactorial forms. If you don't respond or poorly respond to the classical lipid lowering agents, uh, it's because you have sustained drug resistant chronomicronemia. And again, no matter if you have uh, a clear cut genetic diagnosis, you're the kind of patients, if you have had, uh, if you are at high risk, if you should have access to accurate treatments. As for the uh, agent has been, having been approved recently in Europe, it's volanisorcin. And volanisorcin um, uh, is, the, is the second generation of apoc 3 aso yeah, And actually, uh, there is a, a, a GANAC version, mean, meaning a version of apoc 3 aso and a version also of uh, uh, irony, uh, of uh, small interfering RNA of APOC3 in development in phase three, so that eventually uh, patients with uh, FCS might be treated with APOC3 inhibition, through APOC3 inhibition, but with 10, 10, 10 fold less uh, active agent needed to have a, high, the, this, a similar uh, response so that it could dip, uh, provide less side effects. And it's very interesting that uh, it's um, it's in development uh, and in fast track, I would say. Yeah, I can add a little bit about the uh, status of the source in the United States. I believe they have a date to go back in front of the FDA in April. Um, we don't know what the final decision will be, but the FDA has not turned them down. They wanted additional information. So uh, this won't be for the Galnac version. We're just starting. Uh, a trial with the Galnac version that Daniel just described. But for the standard Valanosaurcin, as you recall, the issue was at the high doses uh, thrombocytopenia. And that was the issue that FDA wanted more data on. 
but they are relatively optimistic that if they get the thumbs up in April, that uh, before the end of 2021, we will have melanosaurus available in the United States. Though I don't know for sure, my guess, however, is that it's going to require genetic diagnosis with one of those five genes uh, in order to get access for patients. So that's why I'm so excited about the work that uh, Daniel is doing and whether or not we might all be able to advocate for a scoring system that allows us to treat these other patients that clinically have the disease, but we don't have one of the five classic monogenic disorders. The, the, exactly. I think that um, there are touring horses. The first touring horse is the uh, approval in Europe for, for Valenisaurus and the seven is in Canada. In Canada, the FDA has not approved the Valenisaurus in Health Canada, they didn't either. However, there is a special access program for patients with FCS. And actually in Canada, there are 15 or near 20 patients receiving Valenisaurus through this special access program at the charge of uh, of the sponsor, not at the charge of the health, the, the health system. Uh, and interestingly, the, the health, health Canada for this access program do not require genetic confirmation, could be clinical diagnosis. So we have to work internationally together to make sure that, uh, again, we, we do not force the genetic proof of, uh, of being affected of FCS in the cases where we we are we have a very very high genetic uh, clinical diagnosis score but however i'm i agree with the fact that genetic diagnosis should still be uh considered as it is the case with with fh uh the question what is uh <laughs> these for those patients not having uh already defined or identified monogenic cause or being it was compound heterozygote or homozygote for a neural variant do have we performed wide exome sequencing or GWAS and the answer to that is yes and there are patients and aware of patients who for for whom we have not we have not been able to uh, to identify through uh, exome sequencing on uh, the genetic basis uh, having said that however there are epigenetic factors involved uh, and you know the epigenetic signature of fcs is different from the factorial due to the diet to start with and as you are probably aware of uh, there are nine percent of genes who are not transcripted they are not translated due to epi epigenetic interference so it might be part of the answer actually so thank you alan for this uh, very complete and ex extensive presentation and uh, i would like to uh, to say hello to everybody, uh, hoping that in the near future we'll be able to meet face to face and without a mask at the NLA meeting. Uh, so, uh, what I will in a few minutes today discuss is uh, the uh, interest of accurately diagnose FCS and discriminate uh, the m more frequent multifactorial forms uh, and the familial columnar syndrome forms which is uh, rare but uh, the, it involves different risks but for the patient's perspective it also involves access to different treatments so it's important that we accurately uh, diagnose the patients and uh, making sure that everybody has the right uh, access to the right uh, treatment the, the right diagnosis to start with and the right treatment afterwards so here are my disclosures <clears throat> Uh, well, what I will I, I will just summarize what we will do today. So, re reviewing the new clinical relevant data on columnar diagnosis, discriminating multifactorial and monogenic forms, uh, present clinical diagnosis scoring systems, starting with the European one, which has been published two years ago, discuss genetic diagnosis, exactly what Adam has just said. Uh, it's important to uh, establish a con consensual way to correctly diagnose so that the payers, the health decision makers, the health care providers and patients themselves uh, are aware of what they are, what, what is the real uh, form of the disease they are, they are affected by, what is the, the drug which, which can be prescribed or the treatment which can be prescribed starting with the diet as Alan explained, and then what who could have access to what and will be reimbursed. So it's, it's fundamental. I will present the 
The European Atherosclerosis Society Task Force position on the diagnosis of cardiomyocardia, and then discuss uh, the diagnosis challenge from the perspectives of of the the, the, the uh, stakeholders, including on the perspective of uh, the patients from patients' shoes. So uh, all lipidologists, almost all lipidologists, are very familiar 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 with uh, clinical diagnosis scoring systems. Uh, in FH, we use regularly several of them, and it works. However, um, compared to cholesterol, triglycerides is more complex physiologically, metabolically, genetically. So uh, it raises a huge translational challenge uh, to be sure that we uh, correctly assess cardiomyocardia diagnosis. So it's a complicated disorder, and our uh, objective is to achieve a simple way to diagnose cardiomyocardia, uh, and the domain of best practice uh, in lipidology uh, when we're, we're dealing with rare diseases. It's almost impossible to uh, achieve the level of evidence that, that we can reach with more common disorders. So it's, it will be based on clinical experience, on expert opinions, and also on patients' experience. What we should avoid, however, and it's imperative that we avoid that, is uh, having kind of a in-between situation, not necessarily chaotic, but I would say unclear, uh, unclear in a situation where payers don't know if they have to reimburse this, if the, the health decision makers or the uh, regulatory agencies uh, disagree on the, uh, the, the, the elements that we bring to them and that the patients themselves don't know exactly what they are suffering of. Uh, due to what Anna also highlighted, uh, in the recent years, let's say it started approximately 10 years ago, uh, when with LPL gene replacement therapy and then the OC3 inhibitors uh, and GPTL3 inhibitors, next generation omega-3, there are several new pharmacologic approaches for cardiomyocardia, which have been developed or are still under development. And it raised interest in, in cardiomyocardia for these reasons and other reasons. And the accuracy of, uh, uh, of the diagnosis becomes critical, pivotal. So in the last two years, there have been more publications on cardiomyocardia than in the last 30 years. And among these publications, what, what can we uh, just uh, extract from, from uh, what has been published in the last two years? Well, there, there were more than 40 publications describing or comparing cardiomyocardia phenotypes, genotypes, prevalence, physiology, or burden. Uh, FCS diagnosis scoring systems have been proposed and published. Papers on the genetic basis of uh, severe hypertriglyceridemia and polygenic risk scores have been published as well. And uh, as I said, the EAS Task Force on Rare Dyslipidemias has met twice and has finally published uh, in January this year an algorithm to diagnose cardiomyocardia. There are more papers than the one on this slide that have been interested in the differential diagnosis of uh, cardiomyocardia. But among these papers, uh, what we, we know is that FCS is rare by nature, rare by essence. So it's pivotal again, extremely important that we can discriminate these patients affected by the rare form because the risk is different, because the treatment and access to treatment uh, w w will be determined, but determined by the, uh, the, the accurate diagnosis. So uh, among the publications, some were uh, specifically dedicated to developing a diagnosis score system. Th th this was the uh, paper published by Moulin and, and, and others in Natural Sclerosis in 2018. Whereas, as I said, uh, the, uh, uh, the EAS uh, task force position paper in, published in January was very different by nature. And all the others are based on either clinical biochemical markers, uh, medical history, or uh, genetic uh, basis of the disease. Let's start from the beginning. Uh, Anand explained what cardiomyocardia is, but let, let's let, let's uh, uh, summarize the burden of the disease. So, uh, cardiomyocardia per se is not fair, not fair at all. Uh, approximately 
per, one, per, one, uh, one over one over six hundred individuals might be affected by colon microanema, which could be sustained or or not. Uh, the majority of uh, these colon microanemic patients have a multifactorial or, or polygenic form. The uh, monogenic form, the familial colon microanemia syndrome, affects one or two per million individuals. And usually it affects us, again, Alan has already covered that. Uh, it's caused by B allelic homozygosity or compounded heterozygosity for rare uh, variants having a la large size effect, loss of function variants, obviously, affecting LPL activity directly or indirectly. Approximately one third, however, of patients with cardiomyocronemia have a high polygenic risk score when this has been tested. The challenge is: Do we need to uh, to establish the the, 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 genetic, the polygenic risk score to to achieve or to establish a genetic diagnosis to accurately diagnose FCS? Approximately a little less than uh, twenty percent uh, of patients have uh, cardiomyocardia due to heterozygosity for rare loss of function variants having large size effect plus other parameters. Uh, metabolic syndrome, drugs, alcohol, etc. But, and importantly, uh, more than half of patients presenting with cardiomyocardia, meaning having triglyceride levels above 10 millimolar or a little less than 900 milligram per deciliter, remain genetically undefined. So let's start from the uh, the beginning. Cardiomyocardia can be sustained or recurrent. If it's just all those affected by the monogenic form, the familial cardiomyocardia syndrome, present sustained cardiomyocardia, their TG levels are almost always above 900. However, there are other patients who also present sustained cardiomyocardia, and we and highlighted that at the end of this presentation, we don't uh, have identified a genetic basis for this. However, for those affected by multifactorial cardiomyocardia, thus can present sustained cardiomyocardia, but all, most, most often present episodic or recurrent cardiomyocardia that can be treated because these individuals have a LPL biologically, they are, they are able to produce uh, LPL, which is competent and active. Uh, if we treat the underlying causes affecting phys the physio physiological uh, deficiency of LPL, we can bring to the body some LPL capacity so that we can um, be able to decrease TG levels, which is not the case in patients with a monogenic form where they, are in, they have no capacity biologically to produce LPL. This has been covered already by Alan, I won't, I won't say a word about that. Sustained cardiomyocardia, clinical signs, again, Alan has presented that. So uh, the, the specificity and sensitivity of this is, uh, is, is not sufficient to establish accurate diagnosis because a lot of multifactorial cardiomyocardia patients can uh, present all of these clinical signs here, one day or another. However, and this has been highlighted already, uh, the FCS consequences are huge um, because it's sustained and because it contributes a very important risk of disease, acute pancreatitis being one of them, but it's not the only one. Uh, the uh, emotional impact on the patient and anxiety is extremely important, but there are a lot of uh, elements that, uh, uh, you know, color my per se, it's a lipidology textbook. Uh, it's by essence and nature associated with HDL uh, deficiency of, by, of due to different reasons, less HDL particles and lower APOA1 concentration, uh, problem of HDL maturation, and also we have established that the, 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 these patients have also cholesterol esterification problem with LCAT deficiency. So it's a kind of hypobeta lipoproteinemia. Uh, or abetal apoproteinemia phenotype as well, plus uh, HDL deficiency with huge color population. 
non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is part of the disease. I'm saying that because there are several agents in development for, for an NFLD or NASH, and some of these agents might be um, helpful for patients affected by color microanemia, particularly FCS. So from patient's shoes, again, uh, and as I highlighted uh, this before, so I will not insist, but just try to put yourself for 24 hours in the shoes of a patient affected by the FCS, just in, by eating what they have to eat. Uh, it's, it's, it's not, honestly, uh, it's not an easy, it's not an easy way of life. It's uh, from the patient's perspective, it's not an easy disease. It's perceived as being some, something that is not little or rarely little. So uh, the risk is underestimated for those having not presented uh, 10 or 100 uh, episodes of acute pancreatitis already. But the, the, uh, the, most, uh, the, 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 the fear of pancreatitis in the, among patients of FCS is, is, is an important uh, uh, co contributor to uh, the interference with the quality of life. So, all this highlight the importance of accurately distinguish between FCS and MCS. So we can, how can we distinguish between both forms? We can obviously measure plasma post pill activity, which is unfeasible at the large scale. It's expensive, it's time consuming, it's not validated, and it's risky. Uh, and again, it's not very, for the patients, it's not something which is fun. We can use next generation sequencing technologies and genetic diagnosis. But again, it's not available everywhere. Uh, it's not always feasible. But we can develop simple clinical diagnosis scoring systems correlating with one and two with the, uh, the genotype and with the LPL activity. And this is feasible. However, the EAS Society, the EAS Task Force uh, for the Diagnosis of Color Micronemia is based on next generation sequencing once uh, sustained color macronemia has been demonstrated. So again, it's the, in the ideal world, that would be the way to do this. Uh, if we accept, and Alan raised that, and it's true, that not all FCS phenotypes uh, will present uh, or, or, or a, a clear-cut genotype associated with the phenotype. Uh, you are all are aware of the existence of circulating antibodies, LPL, circulating antibodies, uh, um, LMF1, GPI-HPB1, circulating antibodies, and these are not genetic, uh, genetic, genetic cause of FCS, but it can cause FCS. And there are other forms of polygenic, again, very, uh, the, the accumulation of variants having a small size effect, if you have many of them, you can eventually present FCS without uh, having a clear cut monogenic di diagnosis. Uh, and a um, paper from Dron and Robbie Gilly uh, last year in Journal of Clinical Epidemiology highlighted that. So, in purple, you have the, uh, the, the uh, prevalence of uh, the large size loss of function variants, which per se, if you are a mosaic or compound mosaic cause FCS, but you, we still, as I lighted before, more than 50% of individuals for whom we cannot establish the genetic uh, background. So uh, a couple of years ago, um, a couple of clinicians in Europe, in France and in the Netherlands, thought about it and well, they, they decided to try to diagnose Cardiomyocardia to distinguish fungal forms versus multifactorial through um, a sc diagnosis scoring system. In parallel and at the same time, and we, we, we didn't contact each other. We were working on, this, on, this, on the same uh, kind of, of of tool. The European uh, diagnosis scoring system is based on uh, a score is a, a, a weight given to different clinical metabol or metabolic variables. TG levels, obviously, uh, and TG levels, well, it, it's, it's, uh, if it's sustained, that means that if you have low TG levels, you might not be uh, from an FCS. Um, controlling for secondary causes is essential. Uh, history of pancreatitis, we should understand that not all FCS patients have had the pancreatitis episode. It's exactly the same paradigm that we see in FH. Not all of them um, without treatment will develop uh, a cardiac event. 
uh, at the same age. But there are patients who have had so many episodes that they present pancreatic insufficiency. Um, there, there are a couple of elements that the European scoring system doesn't take into account, and we'll cover that rapidly. And there is something that they have considered, which might not be uh, the best way to do it at this time. So, but the exercise was important, but it was not consensual. It has to be op optimized. So they they are considered the is family f family history, uh, and the uh, if they considered that if you are FCS, which is a a recessive disorder that your family history will be and be, will be normal so that you you won't have an history of fungal combined hyperlipidemia which is not the case by the way because being a carrier of lp of lpl null variant is not neutral um so but the scores the score works quite well we, we assess that and just to highlight the fact that it's it's important to consider the family history in fcs patients it is in multifactorial forms as well the family history cannot distinguish between the FCS and MCM because in both situations, you'll have a family combined hyperlipidemia-like uh, history. The majority of if the results will be either not present a normal lipid profile, they could present moderate hypertriglyceridemia, severe hypertriglyceridemia if there are other factors involved, low HDL, isolated low HDL, high APOB without not anything else. So, it's variable, but there there is a, a, com, a mul multiple possible phenotypes in the affected relatives. So, uh, in a set of 145 heterozygotes, uh, of uh, in in, a fam uh, in 17 families, uh, FCS families, uh, we, we have observed that the majority of LPL variants could could present almost all uh, Friedrichsen class class of lipid disorder. And in, in, in we add to that is isolated IPO alpha. However, something which is interesting is that the European scores, as presented, correlates quite well with post apparent LPL activity. We have assessed that in a set of FCS patients, which were homozygous, homozygous for uh, null LPL variants, and heterozygous for the same mutation. So uh, the uh, coefficient of deter determination is. Uh, 0.63. So, 62% of the score can be 62% of the LPL activity correlates with the score. This is excellent, but it means that it's we're not there, in, in, in a, it's it's not enough. But it's very very good. So there are strengths and limitations of the European Clinical Diagnosis Scoring System and of uh, limitation and strengths for the EAS um, algorithm, which is more d d based on genes. Um, the, the European Clinical Diagnosis Scoring System fairly correlates with, with the genetic diagnosis and PHLA. It's based on simple and widely available variables. It does not consider key samples var var variable characterizing FCS physiology, such as uh, LDL cholesterol, it could be or the, uh, the anthropometrics. Uh, it's not necessarily adequately weighed the family history in several, several cases. So there is a risk of misclassification of some cases and this can be easily improved. And that's something that we I will present in a few minutes. The uh, genetic diagnosis scoring system, well, it's very good to identify almost all monogenic forms except those with, uh, as, as explained before, with, with other parameters. It facilitates family screening of heterozygote carrier carriers in uh, affected pedigrees. It provides a clear diagnosis to the patient, uh, an accurate risk assessment, and importantly, uh, guarantee access to therapies. However, NGS technologies are not available or affordable everywhere. And uh, again, it may not identify some phenotypic FCS or cases of sustained colomicronemia of other causes, as explained. Uh, this comes from the approach and compass clinical trials of uh, pa patients coming from, which was evaluating Volanisursin, which is an EPO C3 ASO. So these, there were 57 FCS patients and hundreds of multifactorial in, in if we combine both studies. Uh, and the exercise was to, uh, to look at simple variables to discriminate between FCS and MCM. Uh, and in, interestingly, if you look at uh, the, uh, the the rock 
uh, the uh, um, curves and sensitivity and specificity param parameters, LDL cholesterol, APOA1, APOB, BMI, HDL cholesterol, pancreatitis history, uh, TG levels are very good correlates. This, uh, and we, there were cutoffs established for each of these variables in, the, in these studies, which are a little bit different than the, the, one, the ones have been used in Europe or the one that we have used, but there is more and more data being providing evidence that we can establish a very good uh, diagnosis through um, diagnosis scoring systems. What we have done and published this year uh, is approximately the same, but what I'm highlighting here is uh, the importance of the BMI to, uh, well, you, you will, there are some FCS who are obese, but it's rarer, but there are some FCS who are uh, lean, I mean, unhealthy uh, weight uh, with BMI below 20 or 18 in some cases. Overweight and, or obesity is rarer in FCS, and it's very, very frequent in multifactorial, which is very often associated with the metabolic syndrome. It will be LDL cholesterol, history of pancreatitis. All these uh, variables are, are um, important. So when we have used the European clinical scoring system that I've presented, and we have repl replaced the familial uh, history with BMI, LDL cholesterol, or B APOB, then we improved uh, the, the uh, accuracy of the diagnosis significantly. And if we add as an option, the genetic diagnosis to that, we, we can correctly uh, discriminate almost all cases. So in conclusion, translating the severe hypertriglyceridemia complexity into a valid, simple, affordable, global diagnosis algorithm requires uh, an international effort. That's what has been done the, la the last two years. And it's very interesting. NGS technologies are rapidly evolving and their use become more affordable and widely available, but we're not still there. Actually, it's not feasible everywhere and it's not necessarily uh, feasible for, for different reasons, te te technologically or because of the cost. Clinically useful diagnosis scoring systems for columnar have been developed and can be improved based on the results of recent studies characterizing FCS and MCM. So uh, moving to, uh, towards a global diagnosis approach of chronic microanemia, uh, we have learned a lot of things in the recent years. First of all, uh, there are key characteristics we can distinguish accurately FCS from MCM, uh, and they are easily easy to measure or to document. Anthropometrics, LDL cholesterol, um, the uh, prior history of uh, medical history of pancreatitis agent diagnosis, secondary causes, response to fibroid, because the majority of FCS patients will not respond or very poorly respond to agents uh, having a mechanism, mechanism of action driven by LPL activity. Um, and the use of next generation sequencing technology of to, of, or of genetic diagnosis uh, it, it, it has to be used if it's available, if affordable, and for all ambiguous phenotypes um, based on clinical scores or limit clinical scores. And if we combine both, then it will, we will solve the problem of accurate diagnosis. So I would like to thank all of you for having listened to this presentation, and I dedicate it to uh, all affected patients and all healthcare providers treating these patients. Thank you very much.
if you can hear me now. I had to call in by phone because I think somebody's got me muted on the computer. I'm unable to turn on my microphone. I apologize for the technical difficulties. I don't quite understand why the phone uh, was getting louder and softer. Uh, Daniel, that was fantastic presentation. I, I'm not seeing any Q and A's, but uh, I am very curious as to what percentage of your clinical chylomicronemia syndrome patients are you seeing that have no gene abnormalities? And how many of those are you able to use a, a, a like a polygenic score to make the diagnosis? I saw that it was 50% or greater that didn't have monogenic uh, abnormalities. But I, I'm curious how you're dealing with those patients and uh, whether, I, I think you told me once about 15% of them were type three. Okay, uh, for the multifactorial forms, we can split the, this, uh, this Christmas tree into uh, more specific diagnosis. So type three patients, some of them can present recurrently colomicronemia. The, 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 the first challenge is to distinguish between FCS and multifactorial colomicronemia. I mean, the monogenic form or all phenotypes being similar to the monogenic forms. And as you highlighted, and it's true, there are patients who phenotypically uh, are clear FCS patients, but for whom we are, we are unable to establish uh, the monogenic demonstration of, of, of causality. And having a high polygenic score uh, can be interesting, I mean, philosophically, but uh, the, the challenge here is to uh, providing an accurate diagnosis to the patient and making sure that this patient has access to therapies being developed specifically for rare disorders and the FCS disease. Uh, and I, I'm aware of, I, I know that uh, several of my colleagues across Canada, at least, have patients who have to come to, to, for, for aphoresis, colomicron aphoresis, regularly having recurrent pancreatitis but no uh, genetic causes having been um, identified as causing this phenotype. The uh, multifactorial form, it, one size doesn't fit all. If, uh, if it's, like, it's important to, uh, to, 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 to more accurately diagnose the, the, uh, the, the multifactorial forms, and yes, several of them, uh, present type 3 dyslipidemia if uh, even in heterozygotes for EPOE2 if they are uh, they have a high polygenic score or if they are heterozygotes for uh, loss of function mutations. Yes, I have an APOE2E2 patient who has uh, an APOA5 heterozygous mutation and he behaves exactly like a monogenic chylomicronemia. I'm not quite sure why he doesn't respond to any therapy, but he's had uh, multiple episodes of pancreatitis. And I have a 14-year-old South Asian girl who's had about 10 episodes of pancreatitis, uh, non-responsive to any triglyceride-lowering therapy, and she has a negative genotype. All her Five genes were normal, and I believe her APOE mutations or, or uh, genotype was also normal. So I struggle with those people, and I, I'm hoping that your scoring system will somehow help us get access to the medications for these patients. I'm convinced the regulators that uh, it's important that uh, the, con the, the uh, consider either uh, the uh, a high uh, di di clinical diagnosis score or uh, the genetic diagnosis, something that uh, has been applied to FH. So, uh, and it's feasible. I'm looking at some questions here. Um, one, one was asking a question about type 3, 3C diabetes in patients with FCS. Well, that's an interesting question because patients with FCS uh, frequently develop diabetes and it's a combination of type 2 diabetes and the, the uh, 
for those having had several episodes of acute pancreatitis, a question of, of a pancreatic insufficiency. So it's often uh, both are contributory, but even in the absence of acute pancreatitis, patients with FCS can develop the classical uh, type two diabetes. But again, there is something else to consider is the pancre pancreas com competency. Uh, Regarding agents, fibrates, omega-3s, or oral that these agents will work in, uh, pa in patients with multifactorial chronomacronemia uh, uh, if they, they have residual LP activity or if they are for oral that um, elements linked to the metabolic syndrome. For FCS patients, um, well, fibrates, it's interesting, and fibrates, it's, it's, or omega-3, it's probably one of the the simple tool that we can use to accurately diagnose uh, FCS or dis distinguish between FCS and multifactorial forms. If you don't respond or poorly respond to the classical lipid lowering agents, uh, it's because you have sustained drug resistant chronomacronemia. And again, no matter if you have uh, a clear cut genetic diagnosis, you're the kind of patients if you have had uh, if you are at high risk, if you should have access to accurate treatments. As for the uh, agent has been having been approved recently in Europe, it's volanisoracin. And volanisoracin um, uh, is the is the second generation of apoc 3 aso Yeah, and actually uh, there is a, a an GANAC version, meaning a version of apoc 3 aso and a version also of a. Uh, uh, irony uh, of uh, small interfering RNA of apoc 3 uh, in development in phase 3 so that eventually uh, patients with uh, FCS might be treated with apoc 3 inhibition through apoc 3 inhibition but with 10 10 10 fold less uh, active agent needed to have a high, the this a similar uh, response so that it could dip, uh, provide less side effects and it's very interesting that uh, it's um, it's in development uh, and in fast track I would say yeah I can add a little bit about the uh, status of the land source in the United States I believe they have a date to go back in front of the FDA in April um, we don't know what the final decision will be but the FDA has not turned them down they wanted additional information. So uh, this won't be for the Galnac version. We're just starting a, a trial with the Galnac version that Daniel just described. But for the standard Valanosaurcin, as you recall, the issue was at the high doses of uh, thrombocytopenia. And that was the issue that FDA wanted more data on. But they are relatively optimistic that if they get the thumbs up in April that uh, before the end of 2021, we will have melanosaurin available in the United States. Though I don't know for sure, my guess, however, is that it's going to require genetic diagnosis with one of those five genes uh, in order to get access for patients. So that's why I'm so excited about the work that uh, Daniel is doing and whether or not we might all be able to advocate for a scoring system that allows us to treat these other patients that clinically have the disease, but we don't have one of the five classic monogenic disorders. The, the, exactly. I think that um, there are touring horses. The first touring horse is the uh, approval in Europe for, for Valenisaurus, and the second is in Canada. In Canada, it, the FDA has not approved the Valenisaurus, and Health Canada didn't either. However, there is a special access program for patients with FCS. And actually in Canada, there are 15 or near 20 patients receiving Valenisaurcin through this special access program at the charge of, uh, of the sponsor, not at the charge of the health, the, the health system. Uh, and interestingly, the, the health, health Canada for this access program do not require genetic confirmation, could be clinical diagnosis. So we have to work internationally together to make sure that, uh, again, we, we do not force the genetic proof of, uh, of being affected of FCS in the cases where we, we, are, we have a very, very high genetic uh, clinical diagnosis score.
But however, I'm, I agree with the fact that genetic diagnosis should still be uh, considered as it is the case with, with FH. Uh, the question is, uh, <laughs> these, for those patients not having uh, already defined or identified monogenic cause or being it was compound heterozygote or homozygote for a neural variant, do, have we performed wide exome sequencing or GWAS? And the answer to that is yes. And there are patients, and aware of patients, who, for, for whom we have not, we have not been able to, uh, to identify through uh, exome sequencing on uh, the genetic basis. Uh, having said that, however, there are epigenetic factors involved. Uh, and you know, the epigenetic signature of FCS is different from the factorial due to the diet to start with. And as you are probably aware of, uh, there are 9% of genes who are not transcripted, they are not translated due to epi epigenetic interference. So it might be part of the answer. Actually, and currently, we are performing a epi wide epigenomic um, study of patients with FCS compared to a uh, multifactorial. Actually, and currently, we are performing a epi wide epigenomic um, study of patients with FCS compared to a uh, multifactorial.